Welcome back to Murder with Friends. Today we're talking about the Donner Party, and I am joined by my co-creator, Amir Nakui. And Amir, where we're jumping back in, we have a settlement at Truckee Lake, we have a settlement at Alder Creek, and then we have the sort of the shining city on a hill at Sutter's Fort. But this winter month, uh, between October 28th when the first snowfall was until January or throughout January, February is when they were, uh, the first rescue party was sent, is where we see a major descent into madness. So can you sort of describe what the scenes were at the respective camps? Yes, yeah, so they built several makeshift little cabins that were just extremely dirty because there were so many people and such limited space. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they had limited resources because of the whole journey that, that preceded that. Yeah, starting winter, they had about 80 people. Yeah. So there were 80 people, and I think that there were maybe four cabins or so. Yeah. And it was, it was dirty. Some of the people were already injured, like George Donner. He had cut his hand open. And it was getting colder and colder every day. Mm -hmm. And additionally, they weren't the most skilled at fishing because they were right next to a lake mm -hmm. and the lake hadn't frozen over yet, but no one knew how to fish. I heard that one man killed a bear. He killed a bear, but then he had it in an abdomen. And that was it. it. Yeah. And so they must have thought when they killed that bear, like, oh, we'll be fine. There are a number of different uh, letters that I read and diary entries that I read where you would have um, these people say, well, it looks like the worst is over. Like, oh, he caught a bear, so it looks like we should be able to eat right. throughout winter. Yeah. And that is what's so particularly heart-wrenching is because they had no idea what was to come. Yeah, and plus they were only 150 miles away. And I think they they had some correspondence with people from their party that had gone ahead mm -hmm. previously on the journey that had reached Sutter's Fort. Mm -hmm. And they had come back and they gave them provisions one time. Mm -hmm. I think that the man's name was Stanton. Yeah, and, Stanton was going back and forth. Yeah, he went back and forth. So before the winter really hit, he came back with some provisions, but they quickly went through that. Mm -hmm. And they had descended by, by the time it was December, they were eating the ox hide that was covering their own wagons and the roofs of their makeshift cabin. Yeah, and they were, uh, what I have here is, diet soon consisted of ox hide, strips of which were boiled to make a disagreeable glue-like yeah. jelly. Imagine that, like, take your leather jacket, for instance, if you, if you have a leather jacket, you're eating leather. Yeah. And that's the limited amount of nutrition that you can find. Cause yeah, because there wasn't else. any grass. I, yeah. I heard about them uh, reducing to uh, eating tree bark. Yeah. But throughout this, they're getting weaker, but we have to remember that these were still uh, westward explorers. These were people with a very resilient, ex you know, with a, a resilient spirit mm -hmm. that they had no idea how bad it was going to get but they knew that it was going to be rough. So they keep trying to get to Sutter's Fort. They keep mm. trying to find uh, Bear Valley. They go on these little expeditions and the most notorious and famous and the one where the Donner Party really takes its darkest turn is with what would be known as uh, Forlorn Hope, the Snowshoe the Party. Snowshoe party. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Snowshoe Party. What was going on here? So they gathered a group of 17 people, mm -hmm. both children and grown adults. I think the youngest was 10 years old. Yeah. Just like, what the fuck are you doing with a 10 year old yeah. going on this rescue mission? But they, they made snowshoes because there was a ton of powdery snow that was very difficult to get through. And as they go on this expedition, after about three days, they're lost, confused, and snow blind. Snow blind was something I had to look up. Can you yeah. describe what it is? It um, like I didn't look worst. it up, but I, I have heard about it before. I think it's because snow is so reflective, it's more reflective than if there's not snow, so everything's brighter. Mm -hmm. If you're out in the snow for that long and there's sun or even in cloudy weather, after a while you become blind. Yeah, and then I, I also read that it, it's supposed to feel like when you get uh, sand in your eyes. Yeah. When you're at the beach and you have all this like sand in your eyes. So does it also have to do with the cold itself? I think it's a little bit of a combination, but what the main thing is all the light refracting. Yeah. Um, and how that is blinding. Yeah. So. So they were lost, confused. They were. They had been gone for three days already. Totally disoriented. They they had provisions only for six days, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they were quickly running out of that. So then while they are running out of their food and they're getting uh, increasingly more desperate, a man by the name of Patrick Dolan says that we perhaps... Need, we need to eat, yeah. Yeah, maybe Each someone other. should die. Is Yeah, they even um, propose that maybe two people have a duel and that's how they would draw sticks. Yeah, or that they, yeah, they two people would have a duel um, or 
if someone happened to die because that's the point that they were looking at where it looked very likely that someone was going to die. Uh, but I ironically, as the blizzard uh, got worse and worse, because uh, then, by the way, it, in the beginning of November, it snowed and it continued to snow for such a great length of time that they were all very delirious. It was hard yeah. to even tell. Some accounts were saying what day it was. Yeah, and it's it's you should also remember that we say like they went on this expedition and they they had provisions for six days and whatnot and they were only gone for three days before they started even considering cannibalism. They were already starving up till that point. Yeah, it wasn't so, like they left feeling uh, well full, rested with a full and belly full. Or anything. They were starving to begin with and then they went on this further expedition. Yeah, they so. were going on this expedition yeah. to out of desperation because camp was that bleak. Yeah. And they knew that if they didn't make a change that their chances were yeah. terrible at, Yeah, and surviving. at least at camp they had boiled leather to eat. <laughs> they didn't have that here, so. Yeah, delicious. Yeah. Uh, well, as the blizzard gets worse and worse, as the snow gets worse and worse, it's actually Patrick Dolan himself who begins to start losing his mind. Yeah, this was kind of funny when I read it. What? What do the, you mean? Though he was, so when you, when it's extremely cold and you, you become hypothermic, a lot of times you just lose your mind and you feel like you're burning up, paradoxically. Really? Yeah. I had never heard when that before. You're severe hypothermia. So at one point, the, I read that he ripped off all of his clothes and ran out into the blizzard, yelling and ranting and raving. Oh, because he was just delirious. He was delirious, Whoa. and that's kind of what happens. You feel like you're on fire. So he ended up dying. Yeah, and then but then he came back and he died a few days later. So he had a he had a major breakdown. Yeah. Uh, took off his clothing, probably gave himself even worse hypothermia than what we can assume he was already sort Correct. of dealing with, and then he. The guy who proposed that maybe they would need to kill someone and eat that person yeah. is the first one to die. Yeah. So. And then oh. after him, a few other people started dropping dead. And yeah, twelve-year-old. The next one to die was, I believe, it was a twelve-year-old. And after this, again, this is the snowshoe party, so we're not at any of the base camps right yeah. now. Um, after they decide that they will eat the remains of Dolan, not all of them, but. Many of them. Yeah, there was two Native American guides as part mm -hmm. of them, and they refused to eat anything. Yeah. So then the the twelve year old boy who was also near death, even though he is f feeding from the human remains of Patrick Dolan, he also dies. And um, they start talking about killing the two Native American guides that they had, and eating them. Yeah. The thing with this the snowshoe party, the forlorn hope, is it seems like. I don't think this is the right expression to use for it, but when it rains, it pours. Yeah. Like one guy died and then another kid died and then two more, uh, yeah, yeah, it was and Antonio look, look, and Graves, two other people died on this trip. And then once they sort of ripped the Band-Aid off where they were able to eat, eat Patrick Dolan and live with themselves yeah. and also survive, it's like they they crossed a line in the sand and then they were totally fine with eating whoever died. Like yeah. once you start with the first body, it's not that big of a deal, except for the two Native Americans yeah. who said that they wouldn't eat. And then... Uh, they started conspiring to eat them. Yes! And one of the other party members went and warned the two guides. And this is where we come to our next murder. Mm -hmm. So they, they were warned that there was plans that they wanted to kill them and eat them. So they both ran away in the middle of the night. Yeah, to they try took to get off. Away. By the way, these are their Native American guides that are helping them with this terrain and this landscape that they are unfamiliar with. And their thanks by this party, which again, they're not in their right mind, but it just, to me, showed that, you know, we are still living in uh, pre-civil rights yeah. America at this point in time, where they're like, oh, we should just, the next ones to go, now that we're all cool with eating human remains, should obviously be the Native Americans because they are not the same as us. Right. So they, the the two two of them they got they ran away in the middle of the night. However, they caught, the rest of the party caught up with them a few days later. And when they did catch up with them, I have a quote actually. So this is uh, according to party member snowshoe party member Jesse Quinn Thornton, with regards to the killing of the two Native Americans. He says, "quote The morning of January eighth, they came upon the Indians lying upon the ground in a totally helpless condition." They had been without food for eight or nine days and had been four days without fire. They could not probably have lived for more than two or three hours. Nevertheless, Eddie demonstrated against their being killed. 
Foster affirmed that he was compelled to do it. Eddie refused to see the dead consummated and went on about 200 yards and halted. Lewis was told that he must die and he was shot through the head. Salvador was dispatched in the same manner immediately after. Mr. Eddie did not see who fired the gun. The flesh was then cut from their bones and dried. Whew. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah, so something that I think surprised me about learning more of the Donner Party for today's episode was how much murder did exist. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when you hear about the Donner Party, a lot of times we hear about these people in desperate times that were forced to feed off of the dead. And that is true, but there was so much anger. People became animals yeah. because of how desperate they were. When you're stripped were. down to just the basics, you people are, you're, killed. Gonna, you're gonna act like an animal people just killed, to survive. People killed, no problem. I mean, th that's what I was trying to get at. Once the first person died, and that sort of that sort of stripped them of their humanity when they realized that they were eating their friend, their other their their fellow explorer. It sort of took away any uh, moral compass that they were feeling about whether or not they should be eating human remains. Um, and then uh, it's still a very sad and sorry scene at uh, Truckee Lake and Alder Creek. But by February 18th, the first relief party arrives. And what they find at the Donner encampment is truly horrifying. So let's take a look at a clip that outlines that. Even the wind held its breath as the suggestion was made that were one to die, the rest might live. Cannibalism. Christmas Day, 1846. They eat their first human. Bodies are cut up, flesh labeled, so people don't eat their own kin. Four rescue parties bring out some survivors. George Donner's body is found, skull split open, his brain removed. So that gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea of what was found at the sites of these camps yeah. because it was really hey they had a system horrid. though so people didn't have to eat their own relatives that's true and that's that's a basic level of de decency sure sure uh, I can only imagine what these rescue parties had to make sense of because it was so difficult to get word and find out exactly what was happening and who was left. And uh, mothers were having to send their kids away and mothers were having to leave their kids. And so a lot of families got broken up and separated. James Reed, who we talked about in the first segment, who was cast away by the party early on, did eventually survive. He made it to Sutter's Fort and he was very instrumental in getting these rescue parties back to Truckee Lake and Alder Creek, um, which is remarkable. The Reed family was the only family that made it out completely intact, which is amazing. But yeah. the Donner Party was the one that I, I shambles. Yeah, the Donner, the Donner Party, Party was Party was further away mm -hmm. in Alders Creek. Just six miles though. Yeah, that, I mean, we've been which talking about a lot. A lot. Six that... miles back then is a lot. Yeah, but you can camp today at Alder Creek. Yeah. I could go there and let's hope be fine and not have to boil my dog to survive. Cause oh, they also ate their dogs. Yeah. Which I'm sure that way, if, if they're eating before. people, well, they wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen, um, I, there's this, uh, what is it, the far side clip? Uh, there's a far side cartoon where it's like we drew straws and it's three guys and a dog. And we drew straws and like, we're sorry, Doug, but you have to die. And it's like the dog just being like, sorry, man. Can you imagine? I missed the far side. That was good. Yeah. Um, so between February 18th and April 10th is when the final sort of salvage party from Sutter's Fort are sent to recover any sort of remains, any possessions that were left. Because the, the, there are Donner orphans, but the, the family members have all died. They've all perished. And um, they wanted to sell the possessions that were left or whatever was left so that the orphans could have some sort of a life. Uh, another thing that I read is that one of the rescue, one of the members of the rescue party proposed to a 12 year old girl when he was rescuing her. Yeah, and she said no. She said no, but was very flattered in her letter to a cousin, yeah, which I was she like, was wow. She was so emaciated and she thought she was gross, but 
this guy still wanted to. Or marry maybe her. she thought she was twelve. Yeah, or maybe she's like, "Why are you asking me I this?" I don't know. It was but, a ripe old age back then. Well, the, what was weird to read about is how they all sort of, you know, it was terrible and it was, you know, it, it was such a dark time in history. But because of the spirit of those who were willing to make that trek out west, they all moved on with their lives. A they lot did. of them remarried if the, if their wives died. Um, a lot of the the kids went on and were, ended up being fine. There was one. Uh, I think a teenager who was with a rescue party, they stopped at a general store somewhere and he ate himself to death because he, yeah, he broke into a store. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So during these reliefs, relief parties, a lot of the people that were coming down were very careful not to give too much food to, to these starving people because if you're starving and you just gorge yourself with food, you die. You, they had to ration it out. Yeah. But when you're starving, you don't understand that. Yeah. And they would just get really... Angry, and these were people who had been living uh, in squalor for so long that manners and that sort of thing—they were—they yeah. were literally willing to cut a bitch for some bread. Yeah. There was a there was an interesting quote when the first relief party came. One of the women, she got out of her tent and she said, "Are you real men or are you angels from heaven?" Yeah, yeah. I the way that I heard the quote was, "Are you from California or are you from heaven?" Yeah. Which is either way, that that's just how delirious they were. Yeah. Um, a final story that I want to talk about because the, there's no way that we can break down everything about the Donner Party. And I know, we hope we've already had to skip over a lot. We, I know. But Hopefully by, by talking about it on the show, it sort of gives our viewers a little bit of a tease so they can look up these stories on their own because there's a lot to read about. There's so many stories that would be their own amazing version of The Revenant if they were isolated on their yeah. own. I think James Reed is very fascinating. Um, Plus, we're, we're just so disconnected from it. I feel like even thinking about being out in the wilderness, like, we, we deal with winters and seasons every year, and we live in every part of this country. But, like, to imagine that trying to survive an entire winter in a mountain... Or just knowing that a snowfall is life or death. Life or death. We that's have, that's have, a that's have, a different mentality. We have fucking roads now. We we don't even think about that. Mm -hmm. These people, there were no roads back then. They were the ones trailing the roads, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they had wagons and they had to move it over a goddamn mountain. And if they couldn't do it in time, they were fucked. Yeah, then that that was that was it. Um, anyway, tell tell this last story. Really paint that picture for us. Let's go for it. Yeah. So, um, Louis Kiesberg, we're we're deciding we're gonna go with his last name being Kiesberg. Could be Kesberg. Uh, if you know the pronunciation, please let us know in the comment section below. So he was one of the families that we mentioned that did make it to Truckee Lake. Uh, he, well, not one of the families, but he was a part of the families, and he was also uh, his own person that made it to Truckee Lake. And as the rescue parties were coming back and forth, beginning in February, they would take whoever was ready to go. And some people weren't ready. They didn't have um, their families back together yet, or some of them didn't have, like, the strength yet, so they would leave them with some rations, and then the next rec rescue party would come, and then they'd be ready to go. And Louis Kiesberg was not one of these people. Mm -hmm. So when they went back April 10th, one of the final salvage parties, they came came across this guy, Lewis, and uh, he was just living his life still around the area of Truckee Lake. And they'd asked him about some people who were also around Truckee Lake that never made it back with the rescue party. And he sort of had these weird stories saying, uh, very vague, amorphous stories like, I saw her and she actually said she was going back with this person and that's why maybe you haven't seen her yet or maybe she's going off to Sa Sacramento or she took off with a guy in the Mexican-American War. Like he had these vague stories about how he was surviving out here and uh, then they looked in his living structure and they found a whole bunch of body parts. Yeah. So that's what, that's what I think drives me crazy about this story is that some people ate people out of desperation, and it's something that they would hope to never speak of again. And then I think you hear about this guy, Lewis, who began to thrive off of it, or at least it became normal to him, yeah. that it was a normal way of life, that it was, he, it was for him, literally a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and yeah. he was fine living that way. Mm -hmm. He never was trying to cross over to Sutter's Fort. He was just living his life, and then the salvage party came across him. And that is what is so unsettling about the Donner Party, because you have to wonder, um, what would you do in these times of desperation, would you just do what you need to do to survive? Or would you find that in that darkness, actually a different side of you would awaken and you would perhaps thrive in 
killing and eating people. Yeah. Like, he was a straight-up cannibal. He was. Um, and that just goes back to our roots as, like, ancient prehistoric humans. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other anecdotes that was that stuck out to me was when they came to to get Kiesberg, they found him and he was holding a severed arm. And as he realized that these, this was a relief party, he threw the severed arm back into his tent. And like you said, when they opened his tent, they found a, like a pot full of body parts. And they, they did investigations afterwards to see if there was any murder involved in any of this. And it all came back inconclusive. Well, I, I also read that they found, they figured out whose arm he was eating when they found him, and uh, that the husband of the, of the dead woman swore that if they ever met in California yeah. that he would kill him, yeah. um, but they never were able to come across each other again. But that's another crazy thing, is because it was so lawless, and there weren't any laws out west, and everything had not been established yet, that the best that this guy could do, whose wife had just been eaten, was... Look, I'm going to kill you if I ever yeah, see you. And also part of it was the the government didn't want these stories to come out and be like so bad. They wanted the West and the people traveling West to seem like a good thing because it was in the best interest of the American government to have as many people go emigrate to the West so they could claim it as their own. Yeah. When that time comes. Yeah, because that, that's what they were trying to do, and that's what was going on with the yeah. Mexican-American so War. So when the news finally came of the tragic situation of the Donner Party, they kind of painted it as like this heroic thing of like, look at these hardy individuals who fell into these tough times. Yeah, they ate each other, but like they made it to California, and they're all better for it. Well, and and I know, think that's part of the reason why these investigations into the murder and everything they didn't really go anywhere. Yeah, I think that the, I think that's part of it. I also think that um, the letters from the people of the Donner Party or the people from Truckee Lake reflected exactly what you were saying. There's one letter from, I think it's the same 12-year-old girl that was proposed to, and she writes to her cousin saying, oh, please come out west. You know, I, I'm telling you this story not to scare you, but just to let you know that you don't know what trouble is. Like, we went through major trouble. You know, cannibalism, boy, is that real trouble. Yeah. But you should still come out here because there's still so much opportunity out here because you could sort of you know, take a plot of land and be like, this is ours now. Um, so, yeah, the, the story of the Donner Party and these people and, and just how resilient they were, but the darkness that they had to brave to get to that point because of, of yeah. the 90, 89, 90 immigrants, 45 survived. Yeah, and I, I think in any similar situation, people will resort to cannibalism to survive like this, if, if given the right context, like you're in the wilderness, you have no other means of finding food, and there's enough other humans around you, I think every time it'll, it'll turn into cannibalism. You have the, you have the whole Andes mountain crash in, that happened mm -hmm. where those athletes, they crashed into the Andes and they ended up having to eat each other. And then I was reading somewhere else that way back when, when there was, when we were living side by side with Neanderthals and we were, the like Homo sapiens were trying to move into Western Europe where the Neander Neanderthals were, we ended up killing and eating them to survive because back then we were just hunter-gatherers. So you think the Donner Party is just a more recent example of yeah. what is in human nature? I think throughout history and prehistory, if you would look back before like we were able to sustain ourselves with crops and agriculture when we were more nomadic. Yeah, this happened a lot. Oh, uh, I don't think about but when I when I was reading through everything, I was telling myself, you'd never do that, Grace. You'd totally never do That's that. That's what you say, but you're not gonna be Grace when you haven't eaten like a nourishing meal in months. When you've had to eat boiled yeah. leather when you, you're not going to be the same person. You're going to be just this organism that needs to eat to survive. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're, you're like a single-celled organism at that point. To that point, you know what I'm surprised we didn't hear about more? Uh, suicide. That's really interesting, yeah. We, hear, we heard a lot about them uh, banishing people and uh, killing each other and eating each other, but... That sort of misery and despair, living in that, I'm surprised that there weren't more people driven to suicide. And maybe there are that we just didn't hear about or 
uh, because, you know, the bodies were just really being, the bodies, they were racking up the bodies, so they were just sort of eating them. Maybe they just didn't detail the cause of death for all of them. But that's what I would jump to, I think, sooner than eating. eating. someone else? Yeah, you know what's going to be really funny is uh, if we're ever like on a trapped on a desert island this this video this episode would definitely come out to haunt us be like yeah. she said she'd never do it and there she was she ate a mirror um i'm this is some weird thing that i've always thought about could you survive off eating yourself like just bits by bits no you'd bleed you'd bleed out yeah but like what if you like you cut like just little chunks of your butt first of all and like you you i only have big chunks of my butt that's true you have a huge ass <laughs> yeah so, but does that work, or does the damage that you're inflicting to your body I think kind you, of counteract the the calories that you're gaining from eating yourself? Yeah, I th and like so, it's never you you can never survive. It's an interesting discussion, Amir. <laughs> Hope you guys weren't eating. Yeah, go eat your ass tonight and tell me how it works out. Look, but I also think that you would pass out from the pain. You wouldn't be able to do it. Okay, I'm not talking about like cutting off an entire butt cheek. I'm just You like, would still pass like, out. Why would you pass out from just like your slicing? I can't wait to hear this debate in the comment section. I want to know from you guys in the comment section below, what do you think about Amir's theory? If you were trapped on a desert island and you had to start eating bits and pieces of yourself, would you do it? What do you think about the Donner Party? Had you heard about this before? Are you totally grossed out? On that note, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and we'll see you next time on Murder with Friends. <laughs>